Chapter 16 of The Film of Fear by Arnold Fredericks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 When Grace Duval, accompanied by the hotel clerk, found Ruth Morton lying on the floor in the parlor of her suite, her first act had been to call for a doctor. Her second was to gather the unconscious girl in her arms and carry her into the adjoining bedroom. That Ruth was alive filled Grace with joy. She had feared something far worse might have befallen the girl. Yet it was clear that some terrible shock had operated to reduce her to the condition in which she had been found. What this shock was, Grace could only surmise. She placed the girl upon the bed and proceeded to remove her clothing. By the time she had gotten her beneath the sheets, the clerk came in, accompanied by the hotel physician. The latter, after a hasty examination, turned to Grace with a grave look. The young woman has experienced a terrible shock of some sort, he said. She is very weak, and her heart action is bad. He took some tablets from a bottle in his medicine case and called for a glass of water. Severe nerve shock of this sort is a serious matter he exclaimed sometimes it is fatal at others the mind may be permanently affected the young lady must be kept absolutely quiet of course we'll hope for the best give her a tablespoonful of this solution every hour force her to take it even if she does not regain consciousness i will look in again in an hour or two but be sure that she is kept absolutely quiet grace sat beside the unconscious girl for a long time in silence once she went into the next room and called up her hotel, thinking that Richard might have returned, but he had not. She felt that she could only wait where she was until some word came from Leary. The clerk, as soon as Ruth was attended to, had hastened down to the lobby, only to learn that the woman who had gone to Miss Bradley's room had not been seen. It must have been almost an hour before Grace was informed by one of the bellboys that someone wished to speak to her on the telephone. She did not take the message in Ruth's room, the management having given instructions that no calls were to be transmitted there for fear of arousing the unconscious girl. She went quickly downstairs in the elevator and repaired to a booth in the lobby. One of the maids had been left to watch over Ruth. The message was from Leary, as Grace had anticipated. Is this you, Mrs. Duval? The cabman asked. Yes. What have you discovered? The lady got into her cab a little while after you left me and drove away. I followed as you told me to do. She drove to an apartment on 96th Street, left a taxi cab, and entered. The cab drove away. I'm waiting across the street in a drug store. The apartment is on the corner. 96th Street and Columbus Avenue. Shall I stay here? Yes. Wait until I come. Grace left the booth and, hunting up the clerk, told him that she was obliged to go out at once. Mrs. Morton should be back very soon, she said. One of the maids is sitting with Miss Ruth. Hadn't you better stay with her as well? The clerk nodded, then saw the doctor coming through the lobby. Here's Dr. Benson, he said. I'll send him up. The young lady will be quite safe until her mother comes. Grace bowed to the doctor, then hurried out of the hotel, and, jumping into a taxi, ordered the driver to take her to Columbus Avenue and 96th Street. She felt overjoyed to know that the woman Duval had been seeking had at last been run to earth. She should, Grace determined, not escape a second time. At 96th Street she found Leary, impatiently waiting for her in the doorway of the corner drug store from which he had telephoned he saw her as soon as she left the cab and tipping his cap came forward and joined her she's in there yet miss he whispered jerking his thumb toward the building on the opposite corner grace glanced in the direction indicated a somewhat dingy-looking apartment house stood upon the corner its lower floor occupied by a florist's shop the entrance was on 96th Street. Leaving Leary on the opposite corner, she crossed the street and entered the vestibule of the building. 
the mailboxes on either side contained five names each indicating that there were ten apartments in the building grace looked over the addresses in them carefully but none of them meant anything to her none was at all familiar the name on the torn card had been ford but there was no such name among those before her how was she to tell to which apartment the woman had gone the situation presented an interesting problem making a list of the names upon a visiting card grace determined to try them each in turn she had observed that the building contained no elevator she rang one of the bells and almost at once the clicking of the catch told her that the front door was unlocked she turned the knob and entered the occupants of the two ground-floor apartments were named weinberg and scully respectively grace tried both doors in succession asking for mrs weinberg at the one and for mrs scully at the other in each case the woman who appeared bore no resemblance to the one she sought and she was obliged to pretend that she had made a mistake the doors were at once closed in her face it was not until she reached the fourth floor that success rewarded her efforts the left-hand apartment on this floor had as its tenant a miss norman to grace's delight she had scarcely rung the bell when the woman she had been following appeared wearing a flowered kimono she looked at grace keenly suspiciously but with no sign of recognition whether she did not know her or merely pretended not to do so grace was unable to say after all it made little difference having now located the woman it was only necessary to get away upon some pretense or other and telephone to richard she felt highly elated what do you want the woman asked quickly are you miss norman i am miss norman i have come to try to interest you in the work we are doing on behalf of the suffering people of poland the war as you know grace reeled off this appeal feeling quite certain that the woman would reject it at once and thus leave her free to go but as it turned out miss norman did nothing of the sort i am always interested in worthy charities she remarked with a peculiar smile won't you come in she held wide the door grace found herself in a quandary was this a plot to get her inside the apartment or was the woman in earnest it seemed unlikely and yet grace feared the danger now that she had gone so far of arousing the other's suspicions by a refusal i i will come in for a moment she said and an instant later found herself in a small rather poorly furnished living-room the woman closed the door and followed her grace braced herself for a possible attack but none came sit down her hostess said indicating a chair no it is too late for that if you care to subscribe anything but you must tell me more about your work it is very simple the money is expended by the polish relief committee to relieve the starving and destitute sufferers in the war zone i see it seems a worthy charity i will think the matter over suppose you call again grace began to breathe more freely i will do so of course she said moving toward the door the woman preceded her let me open it she said the catch has a habit of sticking she fumbled with the lock grace was so completely deceived by the woman's actions that she momentarily relaxed her guard as her companion drew the door open grace bade her good night and started to go the instant her back was turned she felt a slender but muscular arm slide about her neck and she was instantly dragged backward unable on account of the pressure upon her throat to utter a sound her attempt at a cry for help was smothered before it became audible she saw as in a dream the woman before her drive the door to with her shoulder then she was whirled backward and thrown violently upon a low couch she grasped the arm of her assailant and struggled with all her might but to no purpose the woman bent over her her hands at her throat 
grace's brain reeled everything seemed black before her eyes she gasped trying in vain to breathe but the fingers upon her throat were momentarily tightening then almost before she realized it the objects in the room swam vaguely before her eyes and she lost consciousness End of chapter 16The Film of Fear by Arnold Fredericks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Duval, on his arrival with Mrs. Morton at her apartment, lost no time in finding out from the clerk just what had happened. The story, pieced together, confirmed his worst suspicions. The woman, after escaping from the house at 162 West 57th Street, had gone at once to Ruth's hotel, followed by Grace. Here she had interviewed Mrs. Morton, represented herself as Grace Duval, and induced Mrs. Morton to leave the hotel by giving her a fictitious message purporting to be from himself. Returning, later, to the hotel, she had gone to Ruth Morton's room and attacked her. The nature of that attack, the effect upon the girl, were as yet uncertain. Ruth Morton was still unconscious. Meanwhile, as he learned from the clerk, Grace had received a telephone message and hurriedly left the hotel. The clerk did not know from whom the message had come. Duval went to Ruth Morton's bedroom and called the doctor aside. What is the exact nature of Miss Morton's injuries? he asked she has no injuries at least in the sense i think you mean she is suffering solely from the effects of shock what sort of shock i do not know of course fright of some sort terrible fright i should say i am informed that some woman some enemy of hers came to this room and was alone with her there is no evidence of any violence none whatever but the effects of shock are often worse than those of actual physical violence they have frequently been known to cause death you do not i hope anticipate anything of the sort in this case i cannot say the doctor shook his head she must have been very weak her system is responding very slowly duval glanced over to where mrs morton hung in agonized silence over her daughter's bed then went out into the sitting-room. It seemed to him well-nigh incredible that the woman responsible for all this had been able to move about, to elude pursuit, to carry out her threats, apparently without the least hesitation or fear of capture. His professional pride had received severe shock. Two means of finding the woman, he felt, were still open to him, one was to trace her through Miss Ford. He did not doubt that, after what he had said to the latter, she would make an immediate attempt to warn her confederate of the danger that threatened her. Of course, the Ford girl might communicate with her companion by telephone, in which event the tracing would be difficult, if not impossible. The other hope of tracing the woman lay in grace. Why had she left the hotel so suddenly? He did not, of course, know the source of the telephone message, and could only surmise that Grace had, in some way, been able to pick up the woman's trail. Leaving Mrs. Morton with a few words of encouragement, he made his way to his hotel. There was no news there of Grace, however, and he realized that it was now too late to accomplish anything by returning to the house on 57th Street. Marcia Ford would either have long since retired, or else would have left the house to communicate with the woman who had been with her earlier in the evening. Considerably upset by the events of the past three hours, Duval retired to his room and sat down to think the whole matter over. Proceeding on the assumption that the woman in question and Miss Ford were acting together, all the events at the studio, the fake telegram, the missing photograph, became intelligible. But the delivery of the letters in Ruth Morton's apartment, the strange attack upon him while searching the Ford girl's room, 
were by no means so clear once more his thoughts reverted to the attic room the roof of the adjoining house the problem of effecting an entrance to the morton apartment through either of the two windows and then as he revolved the problem in his mind a sudden light came to him he sprang from his chair with an exclamation of satisfaction a solution of the whole matter flashed through his brain a solution at once so simple and so ingenious that he wondered he had not thought of it before he glanced at his watch it was midnight too late perhaps to test the accuracy of his deductions nor did he feel at all easy in his mind regarding grace something must have happened to her he feared to keep her out so late with no word to him concerning her movements he went to the phone and calling up the office inquired whether anything had been heard of mrs duval no the night clerk informed him mrs duval had not been heard from nor had she sent any message but a note had just been left for her he would send it up duval awaited the arrival of the note with the utmost impatience a message for grace from whom what could it mean a few moments later one of the bell-boys thrust into his hand a letter written on the note-paper of the hotel he regarded the scrawling and ill-written superscription with apprehension then tore open the envelope and proceeded to read the contents of the note dear madame it said i waited till nearly midnight when you did not come i thought you must have gone out some other way so came back to the hotel i hope i did right respectfully yours martin leary duval stared at the words before him with a look of alarm who was martin leary and where had he waited for grace until nearly midnight and above all why had she not returned had some accident some danger befallen her the circumstances made it seem highly probable there was but one thing to do to question the night clerk and find out if possible who leary was he rushed to the elevator and made his way to the lobby with all speed who left this note for mrs duval he asked of the clerk why the man paused for a moment one of the cabmen i believe is his name leary martin leary yes it was leary come to think of it nothing wrong i hope mr duval i'll know later where is leary now couldn't say sir you might ask the cab starter almost before the clerk had finished speaking duval had darted across the lobby and made his way to the taxicab office at the door do you know a chauffeur named martin leary exclaimed duval yes sir one of our regular men sir where is he the starter glanced along the row of taxicabs he's turned in for the night sir left for the garage some time ago he's been on duty since early this morning where's the garage on lexington avenue sir near thirtieth street does leary sleep there no sir i don't think so sir they would know at the garage i guess very well get me a cab i want to be taken there at once the starter called to one of the drivers and a few moments later duval was being driven at a rapid rate toward the garage his inquiries on his arrival there developed the fact that leary had left for his home on second avenue some little time before duval secured the address and once more set out he felt greatly alarmed at grace's failure to put in an appearance something must have happened to her clearly the case was going very much against him the woman's second escape the attack on ruth morton now the disappearance of grace he felt that the time had come for action of a quick and drastic nature leary lived with his wife and two children on the third floor of a second avenue tenement hastily climbing the two flights of dark steps duval rapped on the door he was overjoyed when it was opened by a man whom he judged to be the chauffeur himself are you martin leary he asked 
Yes, sir. The man wiped his mouth with the back of his hand, choking down a bit of cold supper he had been eating before turning in. I am Richard Duval. You drove my wife uptown somewhere, did you not? Yes, sir. To Columbus Avenue and 96th Street, sir. Won't you come in? I want you to put on your coat and come along with me. Mrs. Duval has not returned, and I am afraid something has happened to her. The man turned and called to someone inside the flat. Give me my hand coat, Kitty, he said, then turned again to Duval. I suppose I should have waited, sir, but after two hours went by, I made up my mind that Mrs. Duval didn't need me any longer. What is the building at Columbus Avenue and 96th Street? Duval asked as the man, pulling on the coat his wife handed him, strode down the hall. An apartment building, sir. And why did Mrs. Duval go there? Well, sir, we was following a woman, sir. She went to a hotel on 72nd Street, and Mrs. Duval told me to watch for her. I did, and tracked her to the place at 96th Street. Then I telephoned to Mrs. Duval to come, and she did. What time was that? About half past nine, sir. All right, go on. Mrs. Duval came, sir, in another taxi. I pointed out the place where the woman went in, and Mrs. Duval went in after her. She didn't say I was to wait, but I guess she expected me to, because she had sent the other cab away. I waited over two hours, and then, when she didn't come out, I suppose she had returned to the hotel, so I came back too. She wasn't there, though. That's why I left the note. How do you think Mrs. Duval could have gotten back to her hotel, if you were watching the door of the apartment house all the time? I wasn't watching it all the time, sir. I went into the drugstore once, sir, and got a cigar, and then later on I went to a saloon a piece down the avenue and got a glass of beer. Mrs. Duval didn't say I was to watch the place, sir. I thought when she got through what she had to do, she would come back to the cab, but she didn't. Do you think I ought to have waited, sir? The man seemed greatly distressed. No use talking about that now, Duval remarked shortly. I want to drive there at once. Get on the box with the chauffeur and point out the place to him. A moment later they had started on their way uptown. Knowing, as he did, Grace's impetuous nature, Duval could only conclude that her pursuit of the woman had led her into some trap. What danger she might at this moment be facing he could only surmise. The apartment building, when they finally reached it, presented a grim and forbidding appearance. Not a light broke the darkness of any of its windows. The drug store on the opposite corner, too, was closed for the night. The whole locality was dark and silent. There's the place, sir, Leary exclaimed as they drew up to the corner. Tell the driver to stop a few doors up the block, not right in front of the building. Leary nodded. Presently the cab stopped and he and Duval got out. The detective's first move was to ascertain whether or not the building had any rear exit, by which Grace might have left, without being seen by Leary. He walked down the avenue to its rear wall, only to find that it abutted against the wall of the next building. There was no rear entrance. If, then, Grace had not left the place during the past hour, she must still be in one of the ten flats that formed the five floors of the building. But which one? That, apparently, was the problem he had to solve. It would be useless, he felt, to inquire at the doors of the various apartments at this hour of the morning. Admission, at least on the part of those he sought, would certainly be refused. Yet he felt that there was no time to be lost. Stationing Leary before the front door with instructions to keep a careful watch, Duval went into the vestibule, and by means of his pocket light inspected the names of the occupants of the building, as Grace had done a short time before. The hallway inside was dark, with the exception of a dim light at the foot of the stairs. Apparently the place boasted no elevator or hallboy service. The ten names on the boxes in the vestibule meant nothing to him. 
how was it possible to determine which one was that of the woman he sought weinberg scully martin stone he ran down the list trying to find some distinguishing mark some clue that would guide him suddenly he paused allowing the light from his torch to rest upon the card bearing the name of one of the tenants on the fourth floor this card had attracted his attention because it was different from any of the others in the two racks they were either engraved or printed visiting cards stuck inside the brass frames provided for them or the names were written or printed by hand upon blank cards but this card bearing simply the inscription e w norman was neither engraved nor printed nor written by hand on the contrary it was typewritten this in itself at once attracted duval's attention owing to the fact that the various letters received by ruth morton had also all been typewritten if the name norman was an assumed one as duval concluded it to be what more natural then that it should be typewritten on a blank card especially when a regular printed or engraved card was not available when to have it written in longhand would have been a disclosure of identity and when above all the woman in question possessed and knew how to operate a typewriter there was more than this however about the name on the card to convince duval that e w norman was the woman he sought he recalled with distinctness the two salient features of the typewriting in all the letters sent to miss morton the misplaced a and the broken lower right-hand corner of the capital w he looked closely at the two letters in the name before him the a was misplaced the w minus its lower right-hand corner the evidence seemed to be complete the next thing to be considered was how could he first obtain entrance to the apartment building and subsequently to the flat of the woman posing as e w norman were he to ring the latter's bell he felt quite sure she would not respond by unfastening the front door but she would on the contrary be warned and even if unable to escape might destroy the evidence he hoped to find in her possession on the other hand to ring the bell of one of the other apartments might result in the unlatching of the front door but might involve explanations difficult in the circumstances to make there was no help for it however duval pressed the bell belonging to the family named scully it was a long time before there was any response duval had almost begun to despair of getting one when he heard the clicking of the electric latch and found that he could turn the knob and enter the hallway he had barely done so when a big burly-looking man who might have been a bartender or a head waiter appeared in the door of one of the ground-floor apartments clad only in his night clothes well what you want he growled duval stepped up to him quickly and spoke in a pleasant voice i'm mighty sorry he said i rang your bell by mistake uh, pardon me the man glared at him suspicion blazing from his eyes that's an old one he retorted how do i know you ain't a burglar do i look like one duval asked the man ignored this question rang my bell by mistake did you who do you want to see i have some business with a lady on the fourth floor he went closer to the man and lowered his voice i am a detective my friend he whispered confidentially i am here on a very important case the big man's eyes widened the hell you are he exclaimed central office no uh, private hmm the man nodded slowly all right but i guess i'll keep my eye on you just the same he leaned against the door jamb and watched duval as he ascended the stairs 
the detective reached the fourth floor at top speed. He was panting when he arrived opposite the door of the apartment he sought. Once there, he paused for a moment, listening intently. Not a sound came from the interior of the flat. The problem of obtaining access to the place now confronted him. The door was of oak of stout construction. He doubted his ability to break it in, nor did he wish to attempt to do so if it could be avoided. Breaking into private apartments without a warrant was a serious matter. There was a chance that this might not be the right place, after all. He hesitated. Yet Grace might be within, in danger, perhaps, of her life. It was imperative that he should find out the truth at once. Stepping up to the door, he knocked sharply upon it, then waited for a reply. He scarcely expected one but felt that he should at least give the persons within a chance. A long silence ensued. Duval was about to rap again when, to his amazement, the door slowly and noiselessly swung inward, as though impelled by some unseen hand. The room beyond was shrouded in darkness. Duval could see no one. Whoever had opened the door must now be concealed behind it. No one either greeted or challenged him. The door swung three quarters open and stood still. Not a sound was to be heard. The room was as silent as a tomb. Duval stood on the threshold for a few seconds, listening intently. He was greatly astonished by what had occurred. Why had the door been so silently opened? Was someone waiting within, ready to attack him the moment he made a step forward? Whether this was the case or not, nothing, he reflected, was to be gained by remaining where he was. Drawing an automatic pistol from his pocket, he held it in readiness in his right hand. Then, raising his left arm, he flung his entire weight against the partly opened door. The door yielded to his attack. Then there came a dull thud, as though some heavy body had fallen to the floor, and immediately after the hallway resounded with a series of unearthly screams. Duval still moved forward. Then, to his utter surprise, there appeared in the darkness a grotesque figure, which immediately hurled itself upon him and began to clutch frantically at his throat. End of chapter 17《The Film of Fear》by Arnold Fredericks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 it would be difficult to describe the feelings of Grace Duval when, after having traced the mysterious woman who had attacked Ruth Morton to the flat at Columbus Avenue and 96th Street, she had foolishly entered the place and allowed herself to be attacked. The woman's onslaught had been so sudden, so unexpected, that Grace was entirely unable to offer any defense. Her cries for help had been smothered at once, and with the woman's thin but muscular fingers clutching at her throat, she found herself forced violently back upon a low couch that stood immediately behind her. For a few moments she struggled violently, striving with both her hands to break her assailant's hold upon her, but her efforts were in vain. Slowly she realized that she was being choked into unconsciousness. The objects in the room, the woman's set face, whirled dimly before her eyes, and then everything became blank. When she once more recovered consciousness, she found herself still lying upon the couch. Her throat ached fearfully, and there was a dull roaring in her head. She opened her eyes and looked about. The room was quite dark. Only a very faint glow came through the windows at its further end, the dim reflection of the lights in the street. 
so far as she could determine she was alone she tried to move her arms her feet but found them bound fast a moment later she realized that a piece of cloth of some sort tightly rolled had been forced into her mouth she could not utter a sound there was no one in the room but from the one which adjoined it in the rear came the murmur of voices by twisting her head about she was able to learn that the door connecting the two was ajar and through the narrow opening came a thin ribbon of light as her senses became clearer she realized that two persons were in the room beyond her and from the sounds they made the words which from time to time came to her ears it appeared that they were engaged in the operation of packing at first the words that filtered through the partly open doorway were mere fragments of conversation words spoken here and there in a slightly higher key and therefore distinguishable to her she made out that her captors supposed her to be still unconscious that they were preparing to leave the place there's no hurry she presently heard one of the women say in a somewhat louder voice if she had had friends waiting at saw for her they would have come to her rescue long ago i'm sure nobody knows where she is and her husband had gone long before i left the house i was watching and he first went to a saloon on the corner and then drove off in a taxicab so i couldn't have been followed here no but i think we ought to get away as soon as possible when does that train go not until half past five well how do you in the station then why not here because that woman's husband when she fails to return to-night is certain to look for her she probably came in a cab and he might trace her that way my advice is to leave her as soon as possible have you finished packing that suitcase no not quite what do you propose to do with jack i was going to take him with me i don't see how you can do that why not because if any attempt is made to follow us he would be a certain means of identification there was silence for a time grace heard the sounds of drawers being opened and shut as the two women hurried through their task who was jack she wondered there had been no sounds to indicate the presence of a third person in the next room presently she heard the voices again i think the whole affair has been a mistake anyway one of them said petulantly i don't see what you have gained by it i've gotten my revenge on that baby-faced morton girl the stuck-up thing i'll bet she won't act again in a hurry what right has she to be getting a thousand a week when they wouldn't give me a chance at any price i may not be as good-looking as she is but i'm a better actress i hate her i believe she told the director i wouldn't do that's why i didn't get the job and after running down to the studio every day for three weeks too i hate her i tell you i hope she's never able to act again the woman spoke with an intensity a violence that made grace shudder how do you ever suppose you came to connect me with the matter the other woman said after a time they didn't know me address as a studio and even if they had i have never been seen with you i don't see why they ever suspected me i don't know that man duval is pretty shrewd though i did manage to get away from him the other night i'd like to have seen his face when he got back to the cab and found me gone his wife followed you here from the hotel i suppose it took an awful chance i don't understand how she traced me i knew she was following me and when she saw me go up in the elevator at the hotel i expected her to come up too i was afraid they might prevent me from coming down while they were coming up so i walked down i watched from the stairs and saw her and the clerk get out of the elevator on the floor where that girl's apartment was then i came down the stairs and went out the side entrance i knew she was upstairs when i left and i don't see how she traced me perhaps she had her taxi driver do it that's just about it and if he did like as not he's waiting for her yet the other woman laughed nice way he'll have she said that's all very well but won't he see us going out suppose he does anyway it's dark and we'll wear veils and we won't go out together but i don't think he'll wait so long 
If he doesn't, he'll go back to the hotel and report, and then the woman's husband will be up here in no time. I think we'd better get out now. You'll have to leave the trunk. There's nothing much in it." Again there was a long silence. Then Grace heard the door open, and the two women came into the room, carrying their suitcases. She closed her eyes and pretended to be still unconscious. One of the women paused beside her. "'If they don't find out where she is,' she whispered to her companion, "'she's likely to stay here and starve to death.' "'I shouldn't be sorry,' the other snarled. "'But if you feel badly about it, it's easy enough to telephone tomorrow and tell the janitor to let her out. No chance of a cab, I guess?' "'No, not at this hour. We'll take the car down to Forty Second Street and cross over. Are you ready?' "'Yes. I'd better put out the light, though.' "'All right.' The first woman moved to the door while the second returned to the bedroom and snapped off the light. A moment later Grace saw her ghostly figure pass the couch, and then the snapping of the door-catch told her that she was alone. The thought was anything but a pleasant one. If Richard did not happen to remember Leary, she knew she had mentioned him in connection with the address on the torn card he had given her. It was by no means impossible that she might lie where she was, helpless, for days, and in that event starvation, or what was worse, thirst, might very readily serve to fulfil the woman's predictions. She shivered at the thought of spending hours, days, in this place alone. But was she alone? Until now she had supposed so, in spite of the woman's remarks about Jack, for she had heard not the slightest sound. Presently she became aware of a slow, regular scraping sound that seemed to come from one of the rear rooms. It suggested something alive, something moving about with stealthy footsteps. Then, all of a sudden, there came a loud crash. Grace gave an involuntary cry, or what would have been a cry had she not been so effectually gagged. The knowledge that she lay helpless, unable to protect herself from attack, frightened her. She turned her head, straining her eyes into the semi-darkness. Something, some figure, was moving toward her from the bedroom, gliding along with swaying, noiseless steps. What it was she could not determine. From its appearance against the darkness of the doorway, it looked like a crawling figure in black. Presently she heard the sound of breathing, and with it a mumbling noise, as though the apparition were talking to itself. Two eyes seemed to gleam through the darkness. There was a hissing yet guttural sound, human in quality yet horrible to her ears. And then, without warning, the figure sprang toward her and flung its arms about her neck. With a gasp of fear, Grace turned and buried her face in the pillows. Fingers seemed clutching at her hair. An arm, wearing a silken sleeve, brushed her cheek, lay across her throat. A low voice muttered unintelligibly in her ear, filling her with horror. She felt her senses reeling. She thought herself about to faint. Then, in a moment, the creature was gone, and she heard it moving noisily about the further end of the room. From time to time there came a crash, as though in the darkness it had upset something. Then would follow long, uncanny periods of stillness, broken only by the horrible muttering. She lay with her head buried in the pillows, wondering at what instant the figure would again appear at her side. For a long time she remained thus, straining her ears to keep track of the creature's movements, and, as the moments passed, she began to take courage, to hope that, since no harm had as yet been offered her, the thing in the room, whatever it was, might not come near her again. It appeared to have crept to the door, and from it came a low, quite human whimpering, as though it were in great grief. 
Perhaps, Grace thought, this was caused by the absence of the two women. She lay quite still, trying vainly to free her hands from their encircling bands, praying silently that Richard would come to her assistance. Her nerves were badly shaken. She contemplated hours, even days, of such a situation with terror. At least, however, the coming of the dawn would bring one relief. She would be able to see what this uncanny thing was that shared her captivity. Suddenly she became aware that someone was ascending the stairs in the hall outside. Could it be Richard coming to her assistance? She strained her ears, fearing that it might be only one of the tenants of the apartment above, returning home at a late hour. The creature at the door had apparently also heard the approaching sound, for its whimperings ceased. Grace could tell by its movements that it had risen. There was a faint sound of fingers sliding over the polished surface of the door. The steps outside came to a halt. With all her force, Grace tried to cry out, but the gag prevented her from uttering a sound. Then there came a sharp knocking at the door. The figure before it seemed to be fumbling noiselessly with the catch. In a moment, Grace felt, rather than saw, that the door had been opened. Another interval of silence came, and then the person outside flung himself heavily forward. The silence of the room was broken by a fall, a succession of unearthly screams. Grace saw a dark body go hurtling through the air, and then came the sharp, vicious crack of a pistol. The next thing she saw was her husband, bending over her, flashing an electric torch in her face. With frightened eyes, she looked up at him and tried to smile. End of chapter 18《Of the Film of Fear》by Arnold Fredericks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 The first thing that Duval did after releasing Grace from her bonds was to take her in his arms and kiss her. Then he found the electric switch upon the wall and turned on the lights. What? What was it? Grace asked, staring before her in horror what was what he questioned that that thing that was locked in here with me oh, poor creature a monkey i'm sorry i had to shoot it he pointed to a crumpled figure on the floor dressed in a gay costume of red silk but what was a monkey doing here i'll explain all that later where is the woman he glanced toward the silent bedroom they have gone they Yes, there were two. Ah, the Ford girl. I might have known. Where did they go? I... I don't know. To the station, I think. They said something about waiting there for a train. What station? They didn't say. But they spoke of taking a car to 42nd Street and crossing over. It must have been the Grand Central. Or possibly the West Shore. We'll have to try both. Are you able to leave now? Grace straightened out her stiffened limbs. Yes, I guess so. Then come along. As they started to leave the place, two men confronted them at the door. One was Mr. Scully, he of the ground-floor apartment, the other a short, thick-set man, who at once announced himself as the janitor of the building. What's going on up here? He questioned. I heard a shot. Duval pointed to the crumpled heap on the floor. I had to shoot it, though I'm sorry now that I did. It attacked me in the dark. I couldn't afford to take any chances. My wife was locked in there, and was, so far as I knew, in grave danger. Your wife? The man glanced at Grace. Yes. But where is Miss Norman? And how did that monkey get in here? Miss Norman left here some time ago. Another woman by the name of Ford was with her. She brought the monkey. What for? I imagine she didn't want to leave it at her rooms. 
she did not expect to return there and miss norman's gone you say yes where to i don't know but i mean to find out at once she has been guilty of a grave offence on account of which i have been trying to lay my hand on her for several days my wife tells me she took most of her belongings with her in her flight flight eh the man growled and she owes us a month's rent i hope you find her i think i shall meanwhile suppose you wait here in the apartment in case for any reason she comes back if i find her i shall bring her here at once and unless the place is open i couldn't very well get in all right the man glanced about the disordered room that damn monkey has smashed a lamp and a lot of ornaments that somebody's got to pay for miss norman rented this place furnished duval made no reply but nodding to grace led the way to the hall i'll be back soon whether i find the woman or not he said i've got some investigations to make here accompanied by grace he descended to the cab leary seemed overjoyed to realize that grace was safe and began a long apology for his carelessness in not waiting for her earlier in the evening but duval cut him short good thing you didn't he said by coming back to the hotel and leaving the note for mrs duval you made it possible for me to find her and if i hadn't he paused and looked at grace with a troubled face there's no knowing what might have happened uh, tell the chauffeur to drive to the grand central station it was three o'clock when the cab drew up at the curb in spite of the lateness of the hour there were a good many persons moving in and out of the station duval got out and motioned to grace and leary to do the same we will all go in by different doors he explained and meet in the general waiting room if the women are not there mrs duval will look through the women's room if you see them and they make no effort to escape wait for me to join you if they do try to get away detain them until i come it was duval himself however who first caught sight of the objects of their pursuit they sat both apparently asleep on a bench in one corner of the main waiting-room the detective was not certain of their identity heavily veiled as they were until he had gone quite close up to them then he saw that they were miss ford and the woman who had escaped from him while in the cab the night before he leaned over and tapped the ford girl on the shoulder wake up miss ford he exclaimed the girl shivered then struggled to her feet her companion appeared to be too dazed to move although she opened her eyes and stared at him with a vague and terrified face will you come with me quietly he said or shall i call a policeman and have you put under arrest for the attack upon my wife he addressed himself more particularly to the woman who was sitting she now rose and made a movement as though to attempt to escape duval grasped her by the arm it will be quite useless to attempt it miss norman he said i have help close at hand in case it is needed he glanced toward grace and leary who were now approaching i do not wish to use any violence of course but you and your friend are going back to your apartment with me his voice his manner made it apparent to the two women that escape was hopeless they seemed suddenly to realize it to give up further ideas of resistance very well miss norman said we will go good duval turned to leary take those two suitcases leary and get another cab in silence the little party made its way to the street the two women said nothing on the way back to the apartment and duval did not question them there was time enough for that he reflected after they reached their destination within less than an hour from the time of their departure their entire party was back in the woman's apartment the janitor was still there on guard 
but the body of the dead monkey had been removed. Duval, requesting Leary to remain, closed the door. The janitor rose and came toward them. "'Look here, Miss Norman,' he began. "'Who's going to pay for that broken lamp and them vases and ornaments?' The woman regarded him with a stare, but said nothing. "'Never mind about those things now,' Duval said. "'They can remain. "'I have some questions of much greater importance to ask these ladies. "'You need not wait. "'In fact, I should prefer that you did not. "'The matter is a private one.' "'The janitor took his departure, grumbling to himself, "'and Duval closed and bolted the door. "'Then he requested the two women to be seated. "'They obeyed without a word. Why did you send those threatening messages to Miss Morton? He suddenly asked, addressing himself to Miss Norman. She faced him defiantly. I'll answer no questions. She flung at him. You can't prove I sent anybody any messages. Do you deny it? Yes. Duval turned to Grace. You saw this woman enter Miss Morton's hotel tonight and go up in the elevator did you not certainly do you deny that the detective once more addressed miss norman no what of it how do you know i went to miss morton's room her defiance was in no way lessened duval saw that she meant to deny her guilt utterly he turned to leary the woman came to you with the request that you spy on my wife's movements and inform her concerning them the chauffeur nodded yes sir she did again miss norman spoke suppose i did what then you will admit i presume that you fainted at the theatre the other night when the picture of the death's head seal was thrown on the screen and that later you escaped from the cab in which i had placed you certainly i will admit it the hideous thing startled me as for escaping from the cab i had every reason to do so you had not only attempted to drug me but after that you tried to steal the contents of my purse you are the one who ought to be arrested not i the woman's attitude began to annoy duval especially as so far he realized fully that the evidence against her was entirely circumstantial and vague he turned away and began to search the rooms. The search, although he conducted it with the utmost minuteness, was quite unproductive of results. If the woman possessed a typewriter, she had apparently made away with it. The scrap basket contained nothing but a few torn bits of paper of no value. There was no stationery on the small desk in the living room, no black sealing wax such as had been used to make the seals. Duval began to realize that the case against his prisoner was far from complete. Returning from a fruitless search of the bedroom, Duval's eye fell upon the two suitcases that the women had carried in their flight. He went over to them at once and proceeded to open them, one after the other. Search them, please. He nodded to Grace. The latter did so with the utmost care but found nothing of an incriminating nature. The two women sat in stony silence, showing little interest in the proceedings. Duval went over to them. Show me your rings, he said to Miss Norman. The woman held out her hand. Take them off. She stripped from her fingers three rings. One was a gold seal with a monogram upon it, another a cheap affair set with pearls, the third a twisted gold band. None of the rings contained the mysterious death's head seal, or could in any way have concealed it. An examination of Miss Ford's stock of jewellery produced no better results. Let me see the contents of your purse, Duval said, indicating a leather bag the Norman woman carried on her wrist. She handed the bag over with an almost imperceptible smile. Duval examined it, but without result. The seal was not inside. Nor did Miss Ford's purse, a silver one, contain anything worthy of his notice. 
He handed the two back. Anything else you would like to see? Miss Norman asked with cutting irony. Duval walked over to the window and looked out. It was still quite dark. The woman's assurance puzzled him. It was quite clear now that unless he could find the typewriter, the letter paper, the missing seal, and could connect this woman with them, there remained but a single way in which she could be connected with the attacks upon Miss Morton, and that would be by the direct testimony of the motion picture actress herself concerning the woman's visit to her room. But suppose the visit had been made in disguise? It would have been simple enough to have put on a mask on entering the room and subsequently have thrown it away. And Miss Morton, frightened as she had been, might be totally unable to identify her assailant. She had covered her tracks well. Was she then to go free? The matter of the typewriter Duval put aside for the moment. The woman might readily have a friend who possessed one, a hotel stenographer, perhaps, who had permitted her to make use of her machine. But the seal was a matter of more importance. His examination of the several impressions had shown him that it was extremely well carved, a decidedly expensive piece of work. Of course, the woman might have thrown it away during her flight, but it seemed unlikely. What had she done with it? The question was one to which he felt he must find an answer. Again, with Grace's assistance, he examined the articles in the women's suitcases, testing the backs of hairbrushes, the contents of powder boxes, the interior of a cake of soap, a bottle of shoe blackening, but the search was as unproductive of results as before. Duval was forced, against his will, to the conclusion that the woman had made away with the seal, rather than run the risk of its being found upon her person. Is there anything more you want of us? Miss Norman asked, when he had again closed the suitcases. If not, my friend and I would like to go. She rose, as though to take her departure. Yes, there is one thing more. You will have to go to Mrs. Morton's hotel with me, so that her daughter may have an opportunity to identify you. But it is far too early to start now. I will send out presently and have some breakfast brought in. It was beginning to grow light now. Duval suggested to Grace that she had better go out into the little kitchenette at the rear of the apartment and see if she couldn't find the materials for preparing some coffee. He himself sat down at the little writing desk and proceeded once more to examine its varnished surface with the greatest care. He had thought, if the letters had been sealed here, there would in all probability be some tiny spots of the black sealing wax upon the desk top, but he could discover nothing. Presently he heard Grace calling to him from the kitchen. Directing Leary to keep an eye on the two women, he joined her at once. What is it? he asked. Have you discovered anything? No, not exactly. But what does that mean? She pointed to a candle which stood in a tin holder on the table. Do you notice the spots of black wax on the candlestick? Duval took the candlestick up and looked at it. There were large splashes of sealing wax all over the bottom of the tin tray, not minute spots, such as might have been made by the dropping of bits of the hot wax in making a seal, but circular splotches half an inch or more in diameter as though a great quantity of the material had been melted. What do you make of it? Duval asked. I don't know. It looks as though she had melted up the whole stick, for some reason or other, possibly to destroy it. Hardly that. It would have been far easier to have simply thrown it out the window. And besides, the mere possession of a stick of sealing wax, black or otherwise, could not be regarded as evidence. This woman is smart, very smart, and shrewd. Mm, she did not melt up that wax for nothing. I think I have an idea of her purpose, although I cannot, of course, be sure yet. Did you find some coffee? Yes, I'll have it ready very soon. What do you make of this woman's attitude? 
it is simple enough she believes that she can bluff this thing out without it being possible to prove her the author of the letters and she may be right certainly unless miss morton can identify her or we can discover the death's head seal in her possession she stands a very good chance of getting away scot-free the coffee which grace presently brought in was drunk by the whole party in silence duval seemed unusually preoccupied his eyes scarcely left miss norman he appeared to be studying her watching her every movement with extraordinary interest although he strove by assuming a careless indifference to disguise his scrutiny grace who knew his methods realized that the sealing wax in the candlestick had suggested some clue to him which he was trying his best to work out at about seven o'clock leary was sent out to fetch some breakfast by half-past eight they were ready to go to see mrs morton before doing so duval thought it wise to call the latter up and make arrangements about their coming he presently got mrs morton on the wire good morning mrs morton how is your daughter he asked much better the reply came very much better i'm going to take her back to the apartment at once the apartment yes she will be more comfortable there and safer too i think we came here on your advice so that we might escape this fearful persecution but since the persons who have been threatening my daughter have discovered our whereabouts i see no reason for remaining any longer do you no i was going to suggest that you should return i think i can safely assure you that there will be no reoccurrence of the threats why do you say that because i think the woman who has been making them is now in my hands i will bring her to the apartment a little later in the morning so that your daughter may identify her will eleven o'clock suit you yes very well then i will come at that hour good-bye he hung up the receiver and turned to speak to grace his eyes however sought the figure of miss norman she had not anticipated his quick scrutiny and had for the moment ceased to be on her guard duval smiled to himself the theory which the spots of sealing-wax had suggested had in that moment received an unexpected confirmation End of chapter nineteen of the film of fear by arnold fredericks this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty ruth morton had received a fearful shock the evening before but by the morning she had recovered from the immediate effects of it although she still felt extremely weak when duval and his little party arrived at the apartment on fifty-seventh street they were received in the library by mrs morton she greeted both grace and duval cordially but it was evident from her manner that she found the presence of the norman woman and miss ford highly distasteful to her duval drew her to one side leaving the two women in charge of leary and grace how is your daughter now mrs morton he asked better i think may i see her for a few moments yes she is expecting you come this way please she is occupying my room at present she still has a fear of the other one the one she formerly used i see but she need not have it now there will be no further trouble he followed mrs morton into her bedroom ruth looking very haggard and white was sitting in an easy chair by the window duval was amazed to note how terribly the shock of the night before had affected her how do you do miss morton he said offering his hand <laughs> i am glad to find you almost yourself again the girl looked up with a faint smile thank you mr duval i am much better i understand that you have found out who has been causing me all this trouble 
I think I have. But before I go ahead, I want you to give me a little assistance. Do you think you would know the woman who came to your rooms last night, in case you should see her again? Miss Morton shuddered. I... I don't know. I do not think I saw her face. It was all so very sudden. Oh, tell me about it, Duval said. It may help me to get at the facts. That is, if you feel able to do so. I think I do. What shall I tell you? Just describe in a few words what happened. Well, as you know, I had been feeling rather better yesterday, and had begun to rather laugh at my fears. Mother was with me constantly, and Nora as well, and I began to feel quite cheerful again, especially as I knew that you were making splendid progress, and had found the woman who had been writing me. Mother told me that you expected to arrest her before the day was over. She said your wife had been helping you, too. After dinner, Nora, who had been in the hotel all day, asked permission to go out for a while, and Mother told her she might do so. The poor girl had been almost a prisoner since we arrived at the hotel. That was about eight o'clock. About half-past eight, a boy came into the room with a card, upon which was written your wife's name, and a note asking if she might see Mother for a few moments. We both looked at the card, and then Mother decided to go down and see her. She instructed me to lock the door while she was out, and of course I did so. In a few minutes Mother came back. She seemed greatly excited, said that she had seen Mrs. Duval, and that you had sent a message to the effect that you had arrested the woman who had been threatening me, and wanted Mother to come to your hotel at once to appear against her in court. It was necessary, the woman who pretended to be your wife said, that Mother should come at once, as otherwise the woman couldn't be held. We talked over the matter for a few moments, and I told her that I thought she ought to go. She seemed rather afraid to leave me alone, but I promised to keep the door locked, and anyway, as I pointed out to her, if the woman was arrested I had nothing further to fear. At last Mother decided she would go, and left me. I locked the door as soon as she went out. It seemed to me a very few moments before I heard someone rapping. At first I supposed that Mother had come back for some reason or other. Then I thought it might be Nora, who had said she was only going out for a breath of air. So, suspecting nothing, I unlocked the door and opened it. A woman came in, very quickly, before I realized it. She was not tall, and rather slight, and I think she had light hair. I couldn't see her face well, because she had twisted a black veil across it, hiding her eyes in the upper part of her features. She turned, as soon as she got in the room, and locked the door. I was too surprised for a moment to speak, and then I asked her what she wanted. "'I want you,' she said, in a terrible voice, and I saw that she was taking a bottle from her handbag. I was so frightened that I could not cry out, although I tried. You see, the warnings I had received had gotten me so worked up that my nerves were all on edge, and as soon as I saw the bottle I concluded that the woman was about to throw vitriol in my face. So I put my hands to my eyes, and ran into the bedroom. The woman came behind me, saying that my looks would soon be gone, that my days as an actress were over, and other things like that which I scarcely heard I was so frightened. When she got to me, she caught hold of my arm and pulled me around, facing her. I couldn't keep my eyes closed now, for I simply had to see what she was doing. It seemed worse not looking at her, for I thought I might take the bottle away from her and save myself in that way. So I took my hands from my face and rushed toward her. Then she raised the bottle and dashed something into my face. It seemed hot, stinging, and made my eyes burn frightfully. I was sure it was vitriol, and the thought was too much for me, I guess, for I felt myself falling, and, well, that's all I remember until I woke up and found the doctor and mother there. It was a terrible experience. I could scarcely believe them when they told me, after I came to, that I wasn't really hurt at all. Duval looked at the girl's face. It showed no signs of injury, although her eyes were red and inflamed. Then it wasn't vitriol, after all he asked, wondering. No, it apparently wasn't. The doctor said he thought it must have been ammonia. Remarkable. Duval muttered to himself. Why should she have gone to all that trouble just to frighten you? That's apparently all she intended to do from the start. Do you know, Mr. Duval, I've been thinking this thing over, and I believe her whole plan from the beginning was merely to ruin me in my work by fear, and I must say she very nearly succeeded. Very nearly, said Duval with a frown. 
if this thing had kept up for another week or two you would have been a complete nervous wreck i am now i'm afraid miss morton said sadly i don't feel as though i could act again for a long time oh yes you will you have youth and that is everything and now tell me do you think if you look at this woman you might recognize her the girl shuddered is she here she asked yes in the library you think it would be quite safe quite she can do you no harm while i am here very well i will see her if you wish it but i am very much afraid that i shall not be able to identify her duval held out his hand come he said i will take you in miss morton rose and walking slowly and with considerable effort went with him into the front room standing in the doorway with the detective beside her she confronted the two women they regarded her with stony indifference miss morton duval said do you recognize either of these two women as the one who attacked you in your rooms last night the girl gazed helplessly from miss ford to her companion and back again then she slowly shook her head no she said it might have been either of them they look somewhat alike but as for saying which one it was if it was either of them i am afraid i can't the woman was veiled the room was not brightly lighted and i was very much frightened the look of disappointment in duval's face was reflected in that of both grace and mrs morton the two women on the contrary seemed vastly relieved miss norman's mouth curled in rather an ironical smile are you through with this inquisition now she asked for if you are my friend and myself would like to continue our journey you have had no right to bring us here in the first place and i am strongly considering making a complaint against you for having done so she grasped firmly the umbrella she had held in her hand all the morning and turned as though to go leary however stood before the door you have apparently forgotten duval remarked going toward her that i still have a charge against you for attacking my wife very well make it i can prove that your wife forcibly entered my apartment under false pretense saying that she was collecting money for the war sufferers in poland if i attacked her it was in self-defence that isn't true cried grace you sprang at me my word is as good as yours miss norman interrupted and my friend here will bear out what i say she nodded to miss ford you also she again faced duval broke into my apartment without warrant and killed my pet monkey you will have to answer for that as well you have accused me of sending threatening letters to this girl here i defy you to prove it duval who had been coming nearer the woman all the time reached out and snatched from her hands the umbrella she held the others in the room regarded him with astonishment the woman herself gave a cry of anger and starting forward tried to recover her lost property duval yielded to her at once but not before he had torn from the handle two small round balls covered with knitted silk that hung from it by a heavy silken cord miss norman seeing what he had done drew back with a cry of anger a few incoherent words trailed from her lips duval paying no attention to her ripped open one of the silk meshed coverings and extracted from it a small round black object about the size of a hickory nut he gazed at it for a moment then going quickly to the table in the centre of the room brought the thing down smartly upon its surface there was a crackling sound and bits of some black substance flew in every direction a moment later the detective raised in his hand a glittering bit of metal and held it up so that the others might see it the death's head seal he said quietly miss norman fell on her knees before ruth morton her hands upraised 
Forgive me! Forgive me! She sobbed. End of chapter 20「One of the Film of Fear » by Arnold Fredericks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 In reconstructing the case from the beginning, Duval said, later in the day, one fact stands out with a special prominence, the almost total absence of any definite clues. He was sitting in the library of the Morton apartment, and with him were his wife, Mrs. Morton, and Ruth. The thing was very cleverly done, Mrs. Morton remarked. I still do not understand in the least how, for instance, were the letters placed in my daughter's room. I am coming to that, replied Duval. But first, I will run over the case in light of Miss Norman's confession to me so that you may understand it thoroughly and decide what action you wish to take against her and her sister miss ford her sister yes the woman's name is not norman it is ford jane ford norman is an assumed name the two of them came to New York about a year ago from somewhere upstate, a small town near Rochester, I believe. One secured employment in the motion picture studio. The other, the one calling herself Miss Norman, worked as a stenographer. Her interest in motion pictures having been aroused by her sister's stories of the life in the studio, she became an ardent picture fan and she spent every evening watching the films. Her attention was particularly devoted to the pictures in which your daughter appeared, owing to the stories her sister told her about Miss Morton's marvelous salary, her beauty, the ease with which she had become famous. These stories naturally inflamed her sister's mind. Working for ten dollars a week, she began to compare her state with that of a girl of her own age, earning a hundred times as much, and gradually the idea began to possess her that she could become a motion picture star herself. At first she admired Miss Morton immensely, and never missed an opportunity to see the pictures in which she appeared. Then, convinced of her own ability as an actress, she made application at the studio at which her sister worked for a position. It seems she haunted the studio for several weeks without getting any encouragement. Then, uh, more to get rid of her than for any other reason, one of the directors offered her a place as an extra woman in a picture Miss Morton was doing, a very minor part in which she had to appear momentarily as a salary woman at a counter in a department store. Unfortunately, when Miss Morton saw her, she happened to say to the director that she would have preferred a woman of a different type, dark, taller, so as to provide a more effective foil to her own type of beauty. As a result, the girl did not get the position. I am so sorry ruth cried i hadn't the least idea who the girl was and of course i wouldn't have done her any harm for the world i know that duval replied but she did not she is mentally rather erratic and she at once conceived the idea that you had singled her out for persecution that in fact you were envious of her abilities and meant to prevent her from getting a chance oh the thing preyed on her mind and i fancy unbalanced it a little she conceived a violent hatred for you and with her sister began to plot revenge her first move was to persuade her sister to move to the house on 57th Street, 
close to your apartment i think it took them some time to find the place to secure a room situated as miss ford's was but at last they managed it then they went to work the letters were all typewritten on a machine belonging to a public stenographer whom the girls knew jane ford would stop in at this woman's place late in the afternoon and asking permission to use one of the machines would type the threatening letters the paper she used was procured especially for her by her sister at a stationery store downtown the seal a curious thing had belonged to the girl's father and she conceived the idea of signing the letters with it to add to the grimness of her threats as a matter of fact i do not think she ever had the least intention of carrying them out it was to be solely a campaign of fear she had probably thought that she could so frighten you miss morton that your health would be broken down and your work consequently interfered with to such an extent that you would lose your position as i say i think she is rather mentally somewhat unbalanced i cannot account for some of her actions otherwise the mailing of the first letter the telephone messages were comparatively simple it was the delivery of those at the apartment that taxed her ingenuity yet the method was simple enough the girl's father i am told had been an animal trainer in the circus and one of his bequests to his daughters was a pet monkey named jack that had been taught to do all sorts of tricks the girls brought this monkey to new york with them after their father's death when the question arose of delivering the letters in your room miss morton she decided to make use of the animal creeping out of marcia ford's bedroom to the roof of the back building and taking the monkey with her she crossed the roof of the second house and reached the wall of the apartment from here she was in a position to reach either of your bedroom windows in the following manner the monkey was led by means of a long thin rope attached to a sort of harness about his neck and shoulders by going to the rear edge of the back building they could readily swing him over to the fire escape while by ascending to the top of the attic roof overlooking the court they could in the same way enable him to reach the other window the monkey had been trained to carry objects in his mouth this accounts for the row of indentations on the letters found in your room i had supposed they came from some mechanical device fastened to the end of a long pole but as a matter of fact they were made by a monkey's teeth the animal being light in weight and the pads of his feet being of course soft no traces of his presence were found on the newly painted surface of the fire escape the handkerchief that i found there had been knotted about his neck as the collar to which the rope was fastened had seemed a bit weak in some way it became detached probably when the girls jerked on the cord to summon him back after he had completed his task in crossing the roofs of the two houses the monkey's paws as well as the rope became covered with dust this explains the spots which seem to be finger marks upon the counterpane of your bed and the long dark straight line across the bed which i thought might have been left by a rod or pole as a matter of fact it was made by a tightly stretched rope the sending of the monkey on the night when you were lying in bed must have been a mistake you will remember that contrary to your usual habit you retired that night very early a little after eight o'clock if i remember correctly 
the girls coming over the room saw that your room was dark and naturally supposed that no one was in it the grinning face of the monkey standing on the bed beside you was the death's head apparition you thought you saw at your cries the two women at once jerked on the cord and the monkey hastened back to them through the partly raised window leaving no trace of his presence except the black smudges of which i have spoken i have no doubt that jane ford followed me back to my hotel after one of my early visits to your apartment and thus learned my name and address her supposition that i was engaged in an attempt to ferret out the writer of the letters was a shrewd guess the photograph was stolen from the studio by marcia ford who being an employee had ample opportunity to stroll about the place after office hours without exciting suspicion she also arranged the subsequent delivery of the photograph and the substitution of the fake telegram even when i made my night visit to marcia ford's room and was attacked in the dark by the monkey i did not suspect what it was the room was pitch dark and in the gloom i got the impression of a much larger object a person in fact and this impression was heightened by the fact that the animal wore a silken jacket and i felt the sleeve of it against my throat i only regret that the noise the cries he made singularly human in quality made it necessary for me to leave the place so precipitately the ford girl and her sister had evidently just come in and rushing to the room found evidences of someone having been there the monkey had been shut in a closet and by opening the door i had of course released it fearing discovery they arranged to flee at once jane ford went uptown her sister remained to pack up her belongings the visit to your hotel the attack on you was a crazy inspiration of the moment not knowing that my wife was following her and having seen me on the sidewalk of fifty-seventh street as she drove away miss norman naturally felt that if she could get you mrs morton out of the way she would be perfectly safe in going up to your rooms even when alone with your daughter she did not attempt to do her any serious injury but contented herself with hurling the ammonia in her face counting no doubt upon the effect of the shock that would result as i have said the woman is mentally a little unbalanced the things she does are not normal nevertheless they came very near being fatal mrs morton remarked grimly the doctor informed me that the fright the shock of her experience might readily have caused ruth's death or upset her reason oh i do not doubt it replied duval the woman has all the cunning of an insane person she showed it when overcome by the sight of the death's head seal i had flashed upon the screen at the theatre she so quickly recovered herself that she was able to deceive me completely regarding her condition and subsequently to make her escape both she and her sister realized that it had become necessary for them to leave the city marcia ford taking the monkey with her in a cab hastened uptown to join her sister at the latter's apartment she knew that i was not following her for she had seen me drive off to join you mrs morton at your hotel they both thought themselves quite safe and able to leave the city without interference the arrival of my wife at their apartment caused them to hasten their plans 
they realized that we were close upon their heels jane ford knew that the ring containing the death's head seal was about the only evidence that existed against her yet she hesitated to throw it away as it had belonged to her father and she prized it highly with all the cunning that she had exhibited throughout she conceived the idea of hiding it in one of the tassels upon the handle of her umbrella of her umbrella these tassels as you perhaps know are usually made of round bits of wood enclosed in a covering of knitted silk the girl removed one of the wooden balls and having embedded the ring in a ball of black sealing wax put it in place of a wooden one it was a most ingenious hiding place and one extremely unlikely to be discovered how did you happen to discover it mr duval mrs morton asked in this way when my wife called my attention to the spots of black wax on the tray of the candlestick i saw at once that a far larger amount of the wax had been melted than would have been required in making an ordinary seal the impressions on the warnings the women sent were very small and flat so as to be readily inserted into the envelopes containing the letters without being bulky or becoming broken while passing through the mails but here were spots of the wax that had dropped down as large as silver quarters and larger what i wondered had caused the woman to melt so large a quantity of wax i attempted to put myself in her place and to think what she would do to hide the seal ring the idea of embedding it in a ball of the wax uh, occurred to me but having done this what would she do with the ball it was not an easy thing to hide in her purse in her satchel it would have attracted attention at once then i noticed the large black ornaments hanging from her umbrella with their silken cords and tassels what better place to hide the ball of wax in order to test my theory i twice attempted to take the umbrella from her on our way here as though to relieve her of the trouble of carrying it in both instances she drew back at once and refused to allow the umbrella to leave her possession this action on her part convinced me that my guess had been a correct one the subsequent finding of the ring broke down her assurance as you know she has made a complete confession poor woman ruth morton remarked what are you going to do with her that rests with you miss morton if you decide to prosecute you can readily do so the penalty for sending threatening letters through the mails is not a light one and her attack upon you under the circumstances is a very serious matter indeed ruth turned to her mother i think we ought to let them go she said and have the same trouble over again mrs morton replied i could never feel safe with that woman at large i do not think she will trouble you again mrs morton remarked duval she is thoroughly frightened all her assurance has disappeared she begs that she and her sister be allowed to return home at once it seems that some relative in rochester has offered them a home there and they were going to join her when we intercepted them then let them go ruth morton exclaimed i certainly do not wish to cause them any harm especially as you tell me the woman who originated the whole thing is mentally not quite right she is certainly unbalanced so far as her grievance against you is concerned but i feel sure that were you to explain matters to her 
and let her understand that losing her the position at the studio was quite impersonal on your part she will realize the folly of what she has done and come to her senses i will do it said ruth i don't want to injure her any more let them go home in peace very well duval rose to go permit me to say mrs morton that i admire your daughter's generosity very much good morning he and grace bade their hosts good-bye and took their leave she's a lovely girl grace remarked as they drove to their hotel i like her immensely oh then you aren't jealous of me any more because i so suddenly became a motion picture fan richard she laughed don't be silly i suppose i shall always be jealous of you when a girl as beautiful as ruth morton is concerned after all to be jealous is only a woman's way of paying tribute to another woman's charms duval laughed <laughs> it was miss ford's way too he said but as a means of showing one's appreciation it had its faults end of chapter twenty one end of the film of fear by arnold fredericks